One of the tools we use is the Sea Grant Science Symposium. We've actually had one for the past 18 years. There's a, a great need for advocacy on climate impacts to recreational fishing and boating. And the purpose of the, the Science Symposium is to bring researchers, community members, industry, government, and others to the table to talk about difficult topics that are facing Rhode Island, to talk about climate change and how it affects recreational boaters and fishermen. So it's extremely important that we have uh, community science, that anglers actually get engaged in providing fish managers with uh, more robust data. I'm Greg Vespi from the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers, and I'm pleased to be spending some time today with Rich Lipsitz and Todd Correa. And we're just kind of talking about kind of how things have changed with fishing over the years as we feel the water started to warm up a little bit earlier than it used to and stay warmer longer. When do you guys think the first exotic's gonna show up? Who's gonna? You seem to hook into those first, so you would know better than us. You, I think you get more time in the water than the rest of us. I haven't seen any yet, but it does amaze me each summer. Wow, I, like I told you earlier, they did catch their first bluefin tuna off of Cape Cod already, which yeah, is amazing. pretty early. It's starting. And it's there's pretty. bluefish in the bay, and the upper bay. Um, which would, that seems like the whole cycle's moving forward a little bit more. I, I agree, I think we're at least a month ahead of what we Typically usually we think we are. And with the way things have been, it's almost a guessing game of what the fish is gonna be, what the exotic is going to be. You know, what, what's going to change this year? So, uh, you know, obviously we're all starting to recognize, even if it's by default, that things are changing. So, I'm waiting for the first grouper to, to show up <laughs> in Rhode Island. If I'm lucky enough to get that, I'll be a happy man. Yeah, yeah I'm starting to hear reports of some squatigue already showing up. Anybody have any squatigue in sight? Uh, not from this year yet. Uh, we did catch quite a few of them last year to a point where we were targeting them on trips instead of fluke fishing, as the fluke fishing has dropped off last year. Well, if the weak fish didn't keep you busy, from what I heard, the striped bass have. The last few years have been very strong holdover striper years, but I think this year was exceptional. We saw a bait like Manhattan that I expected to be long gone um, in the rivers and ponds where I fish in a week or two before Christmas, which in all my years of, of winter fishing is very unusual. Usually the fish you catch in January or December, or February, March, you know, they're like, they're racers. They're real thin, they're hungry, they haven't had much to eat, but they were big, fat, healthy fish, and that tells me something is changing. And it might be good for me, it might be good for us as fishermen, but that tells me something is wrong. The water's too warm, the bait isn't leaving, and the bass are staying, they, they didn't migrate. So w without that prolonged cold snap to really force them to leave, if the bait stays, the fish will stay. The bait stayed, the fish stayed, and I think my observation is the fish kept coming. To me, it's very concerning if these fish populations are changing and the migratory patterns are changing, that there's gonna be a lot more people putting a lot more pressure on those fishes and those access points. And I hate to be in a position where 10 years from now, we're finding that this, what we are working towards as abundance has been completely reversed because of all the people that have entered the fishery. I agree, it's a good point. I, I think it's an opportunity for us to be catching new species here, to learn new ways, to buy more tackle for different fish. Um, but Todd, like you were saying, if those fish in the salt ponds are breeding, then, then we're going to lose breeding fish that are in there. Uh, so you get an I economic a positive, but you get a you get, you get a, a you, you get, get a fishery negative. To be a negative, right? Climate change affecting where fish live is sort of the the most evident. Fish populations can either you know decrease or increase because of climate change, and then that can have ripple effects. Uh, that can impact recreational fishermen. I think really it's our job as scientists to look at the scientific data, but also to collaborate with members of the fishing industry to understand what they're seeing on the water and really put those pieces of information together. You know, we're like, well, how are we going to adapt to climate change? Well, we just need to go ask the people who are already doing it. Legislative and regulatory and complex, like the system is, is a drag, honestly, <laughs> when you get into it. Um, and so one of the things that, that we try to do is lower barriers to, to bringing that emotional connection and that care 
and that passion into the management system so that it's responsive to what they are seeing on the water. Another major way in which we're thinking about preparing for climate ready fisheries is through federal legislation. And that has to do with the Madison Stevens Act, which is the foundational fisheries legislation um, in the United States. And really just taking a long-term outlook that abundance is a major driver and uh, the foundation of a healthy recreational fishing economy. You know, 10 years down the road, I envision a scenario where we have offshore wind coexisting with a thriving recreational fishery. And I do think for some species, these will become uh, havens or destinations for, for offshore fishing. When I look at many of the other challenges that the world is facing due to climate change, with fisheries, a lot of it feels very local, very regional, very personal. I am optimistic. I, we must start moving faster on it. We don't have time to drag our heels, but we, we do have a real opportunity to change the way that we're doing this and have resilient fisheries for the future. We just gotta get a move on. <laughs> And this relationship between the end user, the fisherman and the boater, the scientist and the fish managers, we need to continue to communicate as the Baird uh, Symposium has done for recreational fishing. Right, and I, I feel there's a commitment to bring in that science and integrate it with the local knowledge so that solutions and actions um, that we take moving forward are based on reality, grounded on science and based on real life situations. Hey, Jen, the Beard Symposium has been great for recreational fishing, and the spotlight is now on climate impacts on recreational fishing and boating. And uh, I think, uh, I know recreational community wants to keep the spotlight on. The University of Rhode Island, we're a public institution. We have a commitment to provide a public service to the people of Rhode Island, especially the Bay Campus, the Narragansett Bay Campus. There's a commitment to respond to these societal issues, mm -hmm. to come together and solve these wicked issues that we have here in Rhode Island. Um, and we have a great track record of doing that and using our creativity, encouraging creativity and ingenuity to solve these issues.